damn. Oh, no, that's too big. What up, y'all? It's almost 8 o'clock, but I got a little anxious, so I just checked in early. What's the deal? I'm a little off center. Let me move right there. What's up, y'all? We in the building. Let me scroll back down a little bit. Napoleon, salute from Cincinnati. Oh, you back? You back in Cincinnati? What's good, my brother? <clears throat> I checked out your um song. I don't think it needs a remix, by the way. I think it's dope. Uh, I, I just thought about that when I saw your name. Tom Barbalat, long time listener, first time on the chat. What's good, my brother? Welcome to the show. We do this every Tuesday, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. What's good? Salute from Las Vegas. I know Las Vegas was off the walls this, this uh, weekend with the Super Bowl. Gregory Nettis, what's up? Kenny, just like there's ghostwriting for rappers, it's the same thing in sitcoms. TV comedy, Norman Lear stole Eric Monte from the Jefferson's Good Times in San Francisco. So yeah, I saw that. Um, I saw that years back. Uh, rest in peace to Norman Lear, the iconic uh, TV producer. But there's a lot of scandal in uh, the creation of his, his black comedy, his black situation comedies. Y'all should check that out, Norman Lear. Yeah, I saw that. Scandal. The, yo, the whole entertainment industry is smoke and mirrors, y'all. It's nothing like what you think it is. Most of the people that you see that you think are dope are good uh, presentations of a lot of people behind them. E-Money, what's good? Tom Barbara, I was an entertainment fan. My wife likes Sublime. Can you talk about the Sublime song named after your brother? Thanks. Actually, um, I can't really talk about it because I'm not too familiar with how that song came about. Um, I said, that's a good question for KRS. I don't know how that song came about. Did they contact him? I don't know anything about that song. Lawrence Henderson, much respect from the Forgotten Borough. What's the Forgotten Borough? Staten Island? <laughs> I mean, the Wu put Staten Island on the map, but Fluffy toenails, what's poppin'? Haitian space program, what's good? I'm here, not on CP time today. Yes. Fluffy toenails. Clarence Knight, oh, it jumped. Ah, uh, let me go back. We're trying to get everybody before I start talking. I want to talk about something funny, too. Rod Woodman, greetings, KP. Greetings, JT. What's happening, KP family? Sign in for another live. JT, thank you so much. Green Lion Entertainment, welcome back. Peace. Hassan Burton, yeah. F you too. What it do? What it do? Green Lion Entertainment, what's good? Um, 73 Trini, what's good? MODX Mike, what up, KP? I'm in the building again. RIP Eddie Chiba. Yeah, I just saw that a little while ago. Um, shout out to the legendary DJ Eddie Chiba. Man, y'all, we losing our, our, our pioneers. Imperial, J the MC, what's good, what's good? Um, Anthony August, what's good? Terrell McMiller, what's, what's good? Um, Odise Parham the third peace guard, peace. Inspired Surfing Artwork, checking in, shout out, DJ Kenny P, shout out. FE2, yeah, Norman Lear stole shows from people, underpaid people. That TV game was brutal too, man. I think you know what I'm gonna I'm gonna make an opinion that's not scientifically based, but I'm just gonna say I think 50 percent of everything we see in here is bullshit, stolen from somebody else. I'm going 50. I'm going 50 percent. I have no scientific evidence for that, but I'm just going with that 50 percent. Row one, yo KP, I went to a Keras show in Hanover, Germany in 2023. Dope, yes, shout out to Germany. Um, shout out to the DJ Sun One on the, on the set. Um, Nate, Nate, 32 times, 32 X was a 32 times. I like 32 times. What's up, what it do? Rosmel, welcome back. Um, where am I? Damon Clark, love the book. Thank you so much for purchasing the book. I got to plug it. For those of you that don't got the book, my brother's name is Kenny. The link is in the description below. It's the whole BDP story. It's everything. Um, it's the origin. 
It's a lot of behind the scenes stuff. It's the true origin of KRS BDP and what we went through as a family to make it out of the hood. It's crazy. Raj Justice Hip Hop. I'm here tonight. My class got canceled. Did it get canceled because of the snow? This snow was weak, too. I'm not mad because I despise snow. But in the New York area, they was acting like it was going to be Armageddon, and it was weak. Um, Transition Tuesdays. That's Russ Williams, Manhattan College Finest. Russ Williams. That's Russ used to be down with us. Um. Danielle to Don Freeman, yo KP, I have each and every single episode you have had. Thank you so much. Um, so with that being said, yo KP, did KRS ever consider making a song with R. Kelly while they were both on Jive? Um, not that I know of. Uh, that's another KRS question. I never heard R. Kelly's name come up. Um, but back in those days, there wasn't a lot of collaborations like that. And um, BDP didn't do a lot of R&B collaborations, although Karis one did do a song with Joe, the singer Joe, when he was on Jive. I don't know if it came out. Is that what I got next? Possibly. I know he did a song with Joe. I'm trying to think if we ever did any songs in all the R&B singers. I mean, shout out to, the, to, to my homegirl Kiva, who sung on Step Into a World. But she was not an established artist when she did that song. So I'm trying to think. I don't think we ever did a song. I give you a bit of a tidbit, but I can't go into the whole story. But Kara Swan was supposed to do a song with Michael Jackson. And it didn't work out. I might have to do that as an epic fail. That's facts. We're supposed to do a song with Michael Jackson. in like mid nineties. Let me scroll down a little bit. 49 Neil, yo, DJ Kenny Park, what's good? Yeah, my 49 is lost. First shot of my broke up, now this. <laughs> yeah, I saw some beef with, um. what's my girl, Jody Watley was dissing the new Shalimar. Wow, I'm a huge Shalimar fan. I love all the old eighties Especially like that early 80s R&B is dope. I saw uh, Jody Watley. It's like she got nothing to do with Shalimar. It's terrible. I'm sorry for your uh, 49ers. That game was incredible. Uh, Crushing up Blackwell. Karis One made valid points about the Grammys a few months ago because the Grammys continuously keep going backwards on hip hop by not televising the rap categories when Killer Mike cleaned house. And that was the reason for the original boycott of the Grammys, the very first Grammy in 1989, which was 10 years after hip hop made its first recording debut. The Grammys finally decided to recognize hip hop and that Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince won the first Grammy and they refused to televise it. So all the rappers boycotted the Grammys. Damon Clark, Kenny, me and my brother met KRS many years ago in a record store in Flatbush. Big up Flatbush, we used to live in Flatbush as kids. I still have the record he autographed. We were tripping on how tall he is in person. Yes, KRS is 6'4". And that brings me to my segue, that's a perfect segue. Last week, let me get a sip of this, let me get a sip of this red cup, hold on. Last week, somebody asked me, have I ever met Pete Rock? And I went into a whole story about how I met my boy Pete Rock, the chocolate boy wonder. And I found some funny paraphernalia. Let me tell y'all a quick story. I'm going to show y'all this record. It's called The Best of the Meters. I was in New York City and I was going record hunting like I normally do back in those days. And I bought this album, The Best of the Meters. I hadn't even heard it. But um, actually, uh, KRS put me on it because BDP sampled. Matter of fact, just about everybody in hip hop back in the 90s sampled from the meters. There's a million samples on this particular 12-inch, um, uh, this particular album, the best of the meters. But you pick up any of the old meters stuff and there's crazy samples on it. Incredibly funky group. 
As I was leaving the record store on my way home, who did I run into? Pete Rock, my man. This is 1992. So I do believe his album, I, Reminisce, had just came out or it was like right bubbling. So Reminisce was out. And I ran into Pete Rock in the village in New York City. And he wrote, I got to cover this piece off so I can show it to y'all. So let me do it like this. He wrote his name and number on the record and gave it to me to call him. As you can see, his home number, I'm trying to cover up these last digits. So, you know, because you know somebody will try to call Pete. I don't know if this is still his home number 30 years later. And as you can see, his beeper number is on there. So um, some of y'all can see the beeper number. Um, Pete, if your beeper is still inactive and some people start beeping you randomly, I apologize uh, if your beeper is still popping. Uh, I just wanted to show y'all that. Let me show you one more time. Let me cover this. For my man, Pete Rock, uh, I saw him leaving the record store and we exchanged numbers. I just uh, was digging through some records and I saw that. I was like, yeah, let me show the people that. We was talking about Pete Rock last week. Shout out to the Chocolate Boy Wonder. I wish he had worked with KRS back in the day. That would have probably been incredible. All right, let me scroll. I'm just going to scroll down a little bit. All right, Justice Hip Hop. I never met Pete Rock, but I know his brother, Grap Lover. I used to run into him all the time when he was teaching school in Washington, D.C. Oh, dope. Shout out to him. I don't think I've ever met him, but um, shout out to him. Peace to CL Smooth. Yeah, of course. Peace to my man, CL Smooth, as well. Dope brother, as well. I saw CL Smooth and Pete Rock this summer at the uh, block party, 50th anniversary block party in front of 1520 Cedric. They were there. I got to kick it with them for a second. Um, what else? Uh, what is this? Michael Carmel. Paul Measure. Sean P did songs like that. F this be a conversation I didn't see. Shut the fuck up part two was not a dig at Karis One. He also did Broken Safety Part Two of Ray Kwan's record. Um, Sean Price was the homie. Matter of fact, shout out to the whole boot camp clique. That's all family, the whole crew. Um, I just saw Rock uh this summer at the West Indian Day Parade. Sean Price uh, was super cool, homie. Super cool with all of us. So I doubt he was I made a dig at KRS. Um, we love the boot camp click around these parts. Uh, Fluffy Toenails and Dragon Breath. Who produced the KRS song, Shut Up Your Face? Oh, man. And I was in the studio for the recording of that. I did not see who produced it because by the time I came to the studio, the track was already up and KRS was doing the vocals. So whoever produced it either laid it down beforehand or gave Chris the beat and he uh, put it onto the two inch. But by the time I got to the studio, the beat was already up and Chris did the vocals. Good question. Ice Cold Beverage, what's good? Peace and respect, KP, we in here. Uh, what is this, brother? A uh, BR Valentine one. Watch every week, but glad to catch you live. Thank you so much for uh, watching, and shout out to everybody who catches the rewind. I love you guys. Like I say every week, this is our real little family right here. You guys are the backbone of this channel. This is the real family right here. Um, still listening to Sex and Violence album to this day. Thank you very much for that. Now I get a good laugh when I hear. I need vinyl part in the beginning because I know it's you. Yes. <laughs> oh, we did that little quick skit. Um, Chris made, you know, anytime you've ever heard me speak on a record, I said this before, is Chris made me do it. I never really wanted to say anything, but Chris is always like, go in the booth, say this, go in the booth, be more vocal, be more vocal. So anything you've ever heard me say on a record, know that it took some coercing is that the coercing coaching whatever from krs1 um jt facts i said the same thing last week krs1 was absolutely right about the grammars he was absolutely right sometimes people need to find out the hard way 
KRS was absolutely right about the Grammys. The Grammys have exploited hip hop and never respected hip hop from day one. Let me scroll down. Hassan Burton, Jody Watley can, can diss the new Shalimar. Um, yeah, but she was, sound like she was dissing um, Howard Hewitt and um, Jeffrey, is Jeffrey Daniels? Sound like she was dissing everybody, though. And Olivier, K Kenny P, what up? We're repping BK and... And I can't see that. I can't see that part. BK. I'm, I read BK all day, born and raised. Imperial J to MC. Can you talk about the BDP Arsenio Hall appearance, the last show? Are you talking about BDP's last appearance? Or are you talking about when all the rappers were there? I wasn't there for the one where all the rappers did. Chris bodied that, by the way. Um, so which one are you, which one are you talking about? Crush, crush your Blackwell. What's your take on Jay Z's comments regarding, in regards to Beyonce not winning album of the year at the Grammys, even though she earned more awards than any artist? I had a mixed opinion about that. Um, first of all, Beyonce has won the most Grammys ever, so she is a Grammy darling. She might be the Grammy darling, and Jay Z has probably won about what 20, 18, or twenty Grammys. So they played the Grammy game. Um, and they probably know more about the behind the scenes Grammys than we will ever know. Um, for Beyonce not winning album of the year ever, I would have to see what albums was she up against. I don't always agree with the Grammy selections. Ever since I was a teenager, there's always been somebody who won and you're like, huh? But... Um, I would like to see a year where Beyonce probably should have won album of the year and got jerked. Because as you know, depending on the competition, you know, there's that great story that Marvin Gaye never won a Grammy until 1984, Sexual Healing. The great, probably the greatest R&B singer that ever lived, pure R&B. The They called him the master, Marvin Gaye. And he never won a Grammy when he had what's going on album is genius and he had uh let's get it on albums and all those motown and he never won a grammy and um it's like how can that be and the reason i think and it's obvious why he didn't win a grammy is because as great as marvin gay was he was out in a time with stevie wonder and stevie is probably the only person that was making music as incredible or more incredible than Marvin. And so should Marvin Gaye have had an album of the year at least once? Sure, he had the material, but look who he was going up against. And I say that to say, who was Beyonce going up against um, that she didn't win? And let me say this sad side note too. There's a lot of uh, back, back door deals at the Grammys. I've seen Eminem speak on it, and I've seen, remember Kanye had that crazy rant where everybody was like, he needs to be on medication. He had the, uh, his face was completely covered, and he was just ranting, and he was ranting on Jay-Z and Beyonce, and he said something interesting in that rant. He said something like, Beyonce, you know, Beyonce only shows up if she's going to win, like, like, almost like she has promised a Grammy, and that's why she makes an appearance. Kanye kind of alluded to something like that and it got brushed over like ah, Kanye is just crazy. But I was listening to that and I was like, you know, it could be something to that. You're a big star. Please show up. We'll give you this award if you show up. You're guaranteed to win if you show up. I would not put that past the Grammys. I don't know that for a fact. Kanye probably knows better than I do. And he said it. Is he crazy? I don't know. I'm going to move on. That was a long-winded uh, that was a long-winded answer. Sorry, y'all. G off Warrell, I'm late to the party. You're never late to the party. As long as you're here, it's all good. Um, JT, Red Cup is like a family member. It ain't like li li live without it. Yes, word. 
rocking the red cups. It's just water, y'all. Just be wetting my whistle. And Heather was like, Heather B was like, why you be slurping that water? Mind your business. Um, Benny Doyle, Kenny, I love Tuesday. Shout outs from Toronto. Shout out to Toronto. I love Toronto. Um, 49 and Neil, everybody sampled the meters tippy toes word. Every the people who sampled the meters is like a is like a who's who. Hassan Burton, peace to CO smooth. Oh, let me scroll down a little bit. I'm far. I'm far. Um Mental, mental son. I'm a black clothing designer. I once gave Karis a few shirts backstage at a Zulu event. Do you have a P.O. box so I can send you some shirts? I'm working on that right now. Thank you so much. I will let you know. Thank you. I appreciate that. Mac Mook, the general. As hip hop heads, why do we still give a fuck about the Grammys? Because we're always searching for validation. I don't know. Like, it's like hip hop always wants to be accepted. I mean, the Grammys is the biggest award, yearly award that you can win. I mean, the biggest award is the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. That's like for your whole career. But on a yearly basis, it's the Grammys. And it's like a stamp of approval from the from the, the establishment. And, and hip hop has never been about the establishment. We came in bucking the establishment and they had to get with us. We wasn't trying to get with them. They had to get with us. But for some reason, we just want to be accepted at their table. And they're like, we'll accept you at the table, sort of. You're like a stepchild. You can sit all the way down at the end. and um, But we'll use you to bring in your viewers. But we really don't want you here. But for your viewers, you know, we'll use you. Even though hip hop is the number one selling music in the world, and the most influential over the past 30 years or 40 years, and they still don't respect us, but we still just begging for the crumbs off the table. You know, that's a really good question. I don't know why we still, I mean, the Grammys is nice. You know, the winner Grammy is nice. I mean, I've never won one or been nominated for one, so I don't know. Um, I have friends who have won Grammys and, you know, it's a big deal. And it, it opens doors for you in the whole thing, but Look how many great artists never won a Grammy. Diana Ross never won a Grammy. Who had a better career than her? You know, it, it, I mean, and there's people that won Grammys that you can't even remember. So, you know, does Grammys make your career? Maybe not, but it's a nice thing to have on your shelf. Um, great question. Platform Radio, big up brother Kenny Parker here for another live. Love the wisdom. Thank you so much. Um, JT at Row. Yes, he did play the pianos on the Bridges Over. Grab the book. He explains it in there. Great read, too. Thank you so much, JT, for picking up the book. I assume you mean KRS One um, played the pianos on the Bridges Over. Yes, he did. Great. That was a great production, man. Just incredible. Just an incredible, game changing song. DJ, DJ J Nice, Peace KP, late to the live. Quick, quick sleeping power to DJ Eddie Chiba. Yes, we mentioned that. Uh, rest in peace to the to the pioneer. Fluffy mm. Tone, as long as you ever took working on a beat. I've taken months and months to work on a beat. Sometimes beats come together in pieces. Like you might have some dope drums, and that's it. And you might put it to the side for months. And then you might hear a dope sample or just a bass line or some horns or something. And you're like, this is dope. Ah, this would go great with them drums from six months ago. And you get on the machine, you put it on it, and it sounds nice. Now you got some drums in a loop, and you might just leave it there. And then another two, three months might pass, and then you might dig it back out and work on it some more. Or somebody, you might give just that little skeleton to somebody and they like it and then you want to go and work on it so i would say i've worked on i've had beats that took 
months. And that's because I kept mess going to it and coming back to it, going to it and coming back. I would say working on one track at one time, probably days. Like once I'm on a track, I'm just going to get, I'm going to stay on it. Probably days. You might mess with something and then go back and listen to it and don't like it and put something else back. Um, FU2, two people died and 23 hospitalized due to an outbreak linked to Kaja cheese and Queso Fresh products sold nationwide. Breaking news. I actually saw that earlier. Um, if you got this cheese in your house, <laughs> those that's watching, throw it in the garbage. Engage VR YouTube channel. I still get hyped off that last Arsenio show. Classic, classic. Yes, it was. Classic. Markeith Bankroll, salute Kenny Parker. More than a foot of snow falls in parts of northern New Jersey. Word? Well, I'm in the New York area, and it was like a little, I mean, it looked like a lot, but then it ended up being nothing. I was just outside about an hour ago. It was nothing. Mentu son, do you have a DJ Supreme story? No, I don't even know who DJ Supreme is. You're going to put me up on that. Um, Takashi Mandela, thank you so much once again. Always a pleasure to have you on the channel, and thank you so much for your contribution. Uh, now I know you have some groupy stories. Did you did you ever go to Freaknik? <laughs> um, there's a million groupy stories. I mean, I don't know if I would go into it on this channel, but uh, not necessarily myself and the groupy stories, but. I've seen a lot of things. No, I've never been to Freaknik. Never had a chance to go out to Freaknik. You know, Freaknik was in Atlanta, and uh, we did a lot of shows back in those days. We was always touring, so only way we would have did Freaknik is if we had a show in Atlanta. And um, the groups they were booking for Freaknik <laughs> probably wouldn't have been BDP. <laughs> probably would have been a Luke. Let's see. Sorry, y'all. I'm just scrolling down a little bit. Imperial J to MC. I think BDP was on Arsenio when Easy E was there. Yeah, that was one of the times before I was down. I did in my time with BDP starting in eight, starting in ninety, end of eighty nine, ninety on. We did Arsenio three times, I believe. When I with when I was there, three, and I believe BDP did like one before me in '89, and then Chris did the last one. Probably like Chris probably did like six or seven Arsenios, and I did like three. And um, I was trying to find this footage for Epic Fail, but I couldn't find the footage. Of um, when we came to do Arsenio the last time, Arsenio messed my name up, man. This dude is always perfect. He had the cue cards and everything. And he said, we have Karis One, Willie D, and DJ Benny Parker. <laughs> and when I walked up, I shook his hand. And I said, Joe, you messed my name up as I walked past. And I... The footage is out there of us when we was on Arsenio, but they didn't get the beginning piece. So I was going to do a whole story behind that, but then I couldn't get the beginning piece. So I just said, ah, and left it alone. But yeah, Arsenio messed my name up. Epic fail. Carlos Mariano, Stevie, Al, Al Green, Donnie Hathaway. Oh, they were in the category with Marvin Gaye while he didn't win. Yeah, I mean, anytime when Stevie was at his run, like 70 to like seven, late, to that, that, those three albums at 70 to like 77 or whatever, them three, you, he was untouchable, man. Rightfully so. I don't think Barry White, did Barry, Barry White might have won one, maybe, I'm not even sure. 
Imagine how great Barry White sold 100 million records and couldn't even get nothing. 49 million. Nowadays, is the Grammys even legit? I heard some Grammys are bought and paid for, like some of those microwave artists. A lot of artists get nominated for a Grammy that you never heard of, and that's to help their career. Because when people see best R&B vocal, and then you see artists, four or five, and then you see artists you never heard of, or that their album just dropped like two few weeks ago, and now they're nominated, that's for you to go, who's this? They're nominated for a Grammy? They must be good. Let me run out and see what it sounds like. So a lot of record companies finagle their way on to the Grammy nominations to get their artists some shine. Now, I don't know if you can buy an actual win. You know what? Anytime any human being, especially in show business is involved, you can pay for anything. Um, so I'm pretty sure you can buy a Grammy. I'm not, you know what? Let me not say I'm pretty sure. I don't know that for a fact. But I feel based on the music industry, you probably could buy a Grammy. But I know that certain artists get nominated to help their career along. Grammy nominated artist. And you like, who's that? I gotta go out and buy this. Dominique Hoka, what do you think about KRS One song Hush being on Tony Hawk Pro Skater? And shout out from North Carolina. Shout out North Carolina. I did not know that. I was in the studio when they recorded Hush. Um, I didn't know it was on a uh on a that's a game, I, I'd imagine, or something. I know that's a big check. That's a big check for the teacher. JT, I fucking told you, they might be old to your ears, but brand new to others. Put that ish out there and let it be heard. Uh, that's something. Um, FU2, this unpopular, this unpopular, but I think Stevie Wonder is overrated. Woo! FU2! Everyone has a right to their opinion. And that's it. That's, that's the opinion. I think Stevie Wonder is rated right where he should be. That's my opinion. Um, Markeith Bankroll, Pete Rock saved Run DMC in the 90s with Down With The Kings. I don't like using the word saved. He definitely reintroduced Run DMC to the 90s audience. Down with the Kings was a ridiculous. Mr. Bald Fingers, you became my favorite page 2024. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, Big Bat, the beat Kanye did for KRS, Rakim, and Nas, Air Force Ones. Are you talking about classic? DJ Premier did classic. Um, if they, are we talking about the same song, KRS, Rakim, Nas, and Kanye? It's called Classic. And I do believe that the beat that DJ Premier did is a remix. They originally rhymed to another beat. And I do believe that uh, either they didn't like the beat or someone didn't like it or they didn't feel like it went or something like that. And I do believe what might have been Karis one suggested Premier remix it. They went and got Premier, I think. So the song classic that you hear now is actually a remix. Big brat, big brat. Don't you make more money after winning a Grammy? Well, it brings a lot of awareness to your project. So if that's the case, yeah, you would definitely make more money. Um, it's more hype. If I can put Grammy Award winning artist Kenny Parker, sounds a lot better than artist Kenny Parker. Performing live, Kenny Parker. Performing live, Grammy Award winning artist Kenny Parker. That makes you go, wow, this guy must be pretty great. Let's go see him. Just that Grammy Award winning in front of your name. Grammy nominated in front of your name gives you some clout. Grammy nominated artist. It still has a ring to it, but it's a lot of BS behind it. Inspired servant, servant artwork. Thank you so much for your contribution. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, 
Thank you for your contribution to the art from KP. Shout out Blastmaster before before somebody says don't F with Chris. Yes. Shout out to the Blastmaster. Working on having him um on here, but I'm gonna with Chris, I'm gonna do more of some stories because there's specific things I want to talk to him about. Um, before I have him on here in a live, I want to talk to him about specific things. So um yeah, but working on getting him on here. I think he's in LA right now. So damn, how do I scroll down? This thing got me. Oh, here we go. Uh oh. Hold on, y'all. Let me let me. Oh, here we go. Let me scroll down. Marco Lopez. Sex and Violence is one of the most fire albums of all time. Your contribution was off the chain. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. That album is bittersweet to me. If you guys haven't seen my Sex and Violence breakdown on this channel, you should check it out. I go through the whole backstory of the Sex and Violence album and what I remember um, working on it. DZ75, can you tell us a story we didn't know about Scott LaRock? Well... There's a lot of stuff about Scott LaRock in this book. So I don't know if you read the book or not. So the question would be, can I tell you something about Scott LaRock that's not in my book? Um, that's a tough question because all the times that I saw Scott, I really talk about it in the book. The times that I was, every time I was around Scott LaRock, it was really something epic that happened. And um, I wrote about it, so um, yeah, you know, it's in it's in the book. I don't want to give it away, but there's a few things about Scott LaRock that uh, that people might not know. Rest in peace to the great Scott LaRock, Joey Joe. I sampled the same joint premiere used for classic remix nine months beforehand. Don't you hate that? When you get a sample and you working on it, and this is like, this is dope. And then somebody big comes out with the sample and just destroys you. That's happened to me. There's at least three Biggie songs that I was working on messing with before um, Big. Matter of fact, that DeBarge sample that he used for one more chance and that big l used i also was working on that for a song with heather b we actually recorded that in the studio and then like we left the studio and like the next day one more chance was on the radio <laughs> that whole session was wasted um and the beat to the warning that isaac hayes da -da -dum, da -da -da -dum, i was messing with that I was messing with Rise, the Hypnotize. I was messing with that, all of these. And then I heard Big and it was over. Um, there's a sample I was messing with that Poor Righteous Teachers came out with. There's a sample I was messing with that ended up being, I, I was messing with it, then it was on the DLC album. When I first started, I didn't know. And I had the DLC album and I didn't recognize the sample until I was in the studio about to mess with it. And the engineer was like, that's on the DLC album. And I was like, what? Went and got the album. was like, oh, my God. At least me and Dre had something in common. Um, but yeah, sorry to hear that, bro. Uh, one of my favorite hidden gem records is I Got Rhythm by the Brothers. Any memories of that record or that group? The brothers, you mean Narkim and Akeem that was signed to um that was signed to um B-Boy Records. I did a whole thing about them. You Karis One versus Biz. A BDP versus Biz Marky on this channel. I go into them if you're talking about the same guys. Drizzy, Stephanie Mills won a Grammy for I Never Knew Love Like This Before. Didn't air it like Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously the Grammys is only, what, two and a half, three hours, and they probably have four or five hours worth of awards. Excuse me. So they can't show everything. 
But, you know, maybe they could mix it up like one year, something will get showed and, you know, mix it up. But they were just rappers never coming on. Like, we just never going to show rap. Come on, man. And shout out to Stephanie Mills for winning the Grammy for that. I didn't, I, I, I didn't, you know, I don't know every Grammy award. That was a big record, though. There was a lot of big records that year, though. JT, you're about to be catching heat for talking reckless about Stevie. <laughs> I'm not talking reckless about Stevie. Stevie for me is, I don't use the word genius often. Stevie Wonder is a musical genius. Brian Richardson, that would be dope to have KRS here. Yes, it would be. Gregory Nettas. Yo, Kenny, you and your brother should have on the 50th anniversary of hip, I guess hip hop. They have Migos, Rick Ross, and the baby in there. 50th anniversary of hip hop should be most celebrated by the pioneers. I mean, yeah, mostly, but you got to include everybody, man. You, you got to include, it's 50 years of hip hop. It's not 40, not the first 30, the first 40, it's the whole 50. And, um, you know, a lot of the new cats feel like the older generation be dissing them and not showing them the respect. Like we feel our our elders were the R and B people. We felt they didn't show us the respect when hip hop was popping. We felt our elder elders didn't show us respect. Now these young cats are feeling like we, being the elders, aren't showing them respect. So I think Rick Ross, Migos, have them all on there. Rock your represent your your time in the game. It's the whole fifty, man. Represent your represent your um your whole your whole your your space in the fifty years. Um, Gray beard, still waiting for you to plug in that SP. Yes, I'm I'm gonna do it soon. Um, Muck Muck the General Guru is one of my favorite MCs of all time. Why do you think he's not brought up a lot on top MC lists? Honestly, I think he gets overshadowed by Premier's production dominance. Premier's music was so great in the 90s that I think it kind of just, you know, Guru was dope in the 90s. But then once again, you got to look who he was out with. Look who, who Gangstar's reign was what? 89, 90, 90 is when uh, Manifest came out, 89, right? To like, let's say 89 to 99. That's a brutal year to be an MC. The greatest to ever do it was all out in that 10 year span. So, you know, he could be one of them people like, like I said, Barry White, incredible artist, but look who he was out. Look at the era he was out with, the Jackson 5 and you know, he's out there with Michael and Stevie and Al Green and Marvin and uh, uh, Earth, Wind and & Fire and all that stuff so you can get lost in the mix. I think Guru could get lost in the shuffle of all of the great MCs that was out. And Cream was so dominant. It's like Premier, like just his force. That's my opinion. Carlos Mariano, Kenny, back in December, we met at the PATH station in which I had told you I was heading to Vinyl Nights with Misbehavior. Cool meeting you at that time. Yes, shout out to my girl, DJ Misbehavior. Shout out to Vinyl Nights. Shout out to Operator M's. The whole, we all play the 45s party. The 45 parties are dope. Um, DJ Misbehavior, that is my good, good friend. My ghost, you need a photo on the wall of you and Heather B from that episode along with any other guests you bring on the show. Yeah, that would be dope. I mean, I usually reserve this wall for the pioneers and I really have a few more that I want to put up. I had Grandmaster Flash picture up for a while. I'm gonna put that back up, but I, I just took it down because I wanted to put up me and me and Biz. Um, that was the very last time I saw Biz. Y'all can't really see it clear. That's the very last time I saw him. He went in the hospital maybe like three months after that picture. Um, so I wanted to put that up. But I I, I really want to put up like the people before me, like Flash and, 
you know, some of those people, I got a picture with Flash. I'm going to put that back up. Um, if I can get a picture with Run or DMC, boy, that would really do it for me, man. That would really, that's like a bucket list picture. I need, I think I have a picture with Grandmaster Cavs. I got a picture with Grandmaster Cavs. I'm going to put that up. I got a picture with Grand Wizard Theodore. I got a picture with Curtis Blow. I should put all of those up. Yeah, but shout out to my girl, Heather B. I was just, we did a Super Bowl party on Sunday. Me, Heather B, and Sway from Sway in the Morning. Shout out to Sway. Uh, I think I'm going to post some footage on my Instagram. DJ Kenny Parker on Instagram. I'm going to post some footage. Uh, me and Heather and Sway had a great time. And DJ Premier came to the party. I had a chance to kick it with my boy Preen for a little while. And I, I he had on a Gangstar sweatshirt with Gangstar. And I was like, Preem, I need that. He said he's going to get me one. So I got to call him. I'm, hopefully by next, you know, that's going to be my mission for next week to get this get this Gangstar t-shirt from Preem. Hopefully next week, y'all, I'm going to have this shirt on. Um, um, let's see. Joy Joe, yeah, I hate it. In fact, I even stole a premiere snare from my beat. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're talking about um coming out with a track and then somebody big comes out with it. Um, Benny Doyle, I'm grabbing you now, showing you how not to get jerked when you do hard work. Yeah, that song, How Not to Get Jerked, I do believe that was on Sex and Violence. And KRS would know, considering he got jerked for criminal minded, him and Scott LaRock lost millions. JT, hey, Ken, this is my weekly service. It's Just Ice request. Let's make it happen. I'm calling Justice. That's two things on my list for this week. Call Just Ice and get this shirt from DJ Premier. Let's see how, let's see if I can get this to happen. Um, Mentu Son. DJ Supreme, a.k.a. AKA Grandmaster DJ Supreme, won the DMC DJ contest a couple of times. Used to DJ for KRS once in a while and also Lauren Hill. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. Um, well, shout out to him, but yeah, I, I wasn't familiar. Shout out to shout out to DJ Supreme. Muck Muck, RIP to the Diabolical Bismarck E. Yes, I was just talking to my man Jetta. Um, shout out to Jetta. Defense wins championships. <laughs> I was just talking to my man Jetta about um, the Bismarcky documentary and how I can't even bring myself to watch it. I miss him so much, but I'm going to watch it. Um, the Colonel James, what did, what did you think of the documentary about Grandmaster Flash on Vice? I just caught it and loved it. I did not see that. I need to watch that. Grandmaster Flash is my DJ hero. Grandmaster Flash and DJ Red Alert are my two DJ heroes. Wasn't for Flash, none of us would be. None of this hip hop, none of this would be. Hip hop wouldn't even be hip hop without Flash. He is a pillar. He is part of the foundation that we are all standing on. And Red Alert for radio for me. Those are my two DJ heroes. P100, DJ Misbehavior, you and I DJ 45s at that spot on Myrtle once about 10 years ago. Brixton to Brooklyn. Salute. Salute, P100. Yes. Yeah, I love DJing the 45s. That's, those are dope parties. Raw Justice Hip Hop. Do you ever flip samples so that they are not recognizable? If I know where the producer got the sample, I find myself less impressed by the production. Oh, uh, well, it really depends. I mean, first of all, if you know where the producer got the sample, but sometimes getting that record was so hard. Part of the whole thing of, of, of hip hop production and sampling is digging in the crates. Some records were so rare that sometimes it's not even about this, where he got the sample. It's how did he get his hands on the record? Now, Every sample is up on YouTube or whatever. You could just sample right off the computer. Back in those days, you had to find records that were so rare 
maybe a hundred copies, 200 copies were ever made. And there's probably like eight or 12 of them still in existence. And somebody finds one of those and, and, and samples from it. That, that's hard, man. Um, yeah, I flipped samples so that they weren't recognizable. I've used samples that were recognizable. I mean, it depends on the sample. Um, I would find myself being less impressed with the production if I hear the sample and it's like anybody could have done it. And it's not, I don't like, I don't want to use the word less impressed. It takes off a little of the luster when you hear the sample. If somebody sampled us the record, like some samples, it's just the whole record in its entirety. You just sample four bars. And the sample is so ridiculous. It comes with the drums, the bass, the horn. It's just everything is there. You just sample it, loop it, and just go. Those samples, some of them are very hard to find. But when you find something like that, it didn't really take much work. You just sampled it um, and just put it in the machine and let the machine do the work. But then sometimes you find samples and you hear it and you're like, that's all he had to work with? that little piece and he turned that into that that's incredible those are the samples that blow my mind when you hear what somebody had to work with and what they did with this little snippet makes it incredible um you know sometimes you can sample something like uh i don't know good times by chic if you sample good times i mean anybody can sample good times that's not really uh amazing even though if you get a hit record with good times more power to you a hit is a hit but you know then sometimes you hear like something that dj premier did or chopped up something i think he was one of the early dudes that was chopping crazy and you hear the little you'll listen to a record you hear something that goes dum, 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 that's it go by and then you'll be like yo preen took that little noise and made it yo crazy so yeah, so it depends on the sample to me. April 7th, the artwork. You had you had an SP party. You bring that tuna. <laughs> Shout out to the tuna and the cranberry. Those of you that saw the Heavy B episode. Um, I would bring the tuna. GF, G off. Finally watched the Bismarck documentary at the weekend. Rest in power. Yeah, I'm going to watch it. Um, DJ KD Hover 20. That mass appeal sample is incredible. Yeah. Preem did so many incredible beats, man. I just. And he's such a cool brother, man. That's just my dude for life, man. I saw him. I haven't seen him in a long time. And I saw him, like I said, at this party for with Sway that, that Sway and Heather did. And he was just there watching the game. He was chilling with everybody else, just watching the, um, the Super Bowl. And this guy is just a producer icon. And I don't like to use the word icon. I don't like to use the word icon that much. And I don't like to use the word genius that much. But Premier is an icon in this production game. And he was just sitting there chilling, regular, no entourage, no security, no look at me, just chilling, watching a football game. Nate 32 X, what's your favorite Dilla production? Um, probably calm in the light off the top of my head. I like Erica Badu, didn't you know? I mean, I don't know how hard that is. I just like that song. Um, yeah, off the top of my head, that's probably my favorite. He did um, Vibes, Vibrations, Stakes is High. Stakes is High is banging too. Luxury Pick, pick X, Salute at KP and Chat. Thank you. Salute. Besides the SP-1200, any other drum machines have you used? Nope. I've just been on the SP-1200 all these years. I mean, sometimes I chop stuff. I've made beats in Pro Tools, not using like the Pro Tools um, sounds, but like taking a bit of a record, extending it, and, and placing kicks and snares 
where they belong and kind of beefing it up. So I've like pieced together beats in Pro Tools. That's in the past like 10 years or so. But mostly SP1200, which is right here. Y'all can't see it, the cameras too. Triggs, yeah, far side running. Running was dope. Running was dope. Um, but far, um, the light was my there are times when you need someone out the store. He killed that. Damn it, clock. Yo, Kenny, who wins the chopping battle, Premier or Large Pro? <laughs> wow. That's Large Pro is another incredible, incredible producer and a great guy. I'm going to leave that one alone. Prem is incredible at chopping, y'all. DJ Superman saw Dilla got way better beats. He must not really listen to him. I listened to him. He used to my favorite. I'm talking about records that came out. I mean, he got tons of beats, but I'm talking about records that came out that, that hit me. Um, that's the, the ones that I mentioned off the top of my head. I mean, he done some stuff with Tribe that I like, but I like The Light by Common. That I like that song. I like it so much. Underdog Riley. Running is another classic. Running is dope. Pat did that 32. DJ Kenny Parker, this is this your cousin. Oh, Patrick Parker. Just trying to get adopted into the BDP family, bro. Same last name. Hook a brother up. Oh. You are officially adopted. Welcome to the BDP family. Patrick Parker. Tone 210. Easy Mo B. Oh, this just shot up. Easy Mo B is incredible. Y'all naming incredible people. A shout out to Mo B. That's my dude. Um, and now the, these dudes, are, I mean, it, it's at the, all these dudes are incredible, man. All of these dudes are incredible. Transition Tuesdays. Russ Williams. Yes, Premier was at my table at the Sunday Super Bowl party. Oh, dope. You was there? Dope. We need that book. My brother's name is Kenny. Audio book. Working on it right now. Yeah, Russ Williams. We talked for a little while. Yes. Um, working on it now. KB Play. Any 45 King stories? 45 King is one of my most unsung producers. Has some of the best drums ever. I've seen him, children, seen him hung in D and D so many times. Do I have a Forty Five King story? Um, not really a story. I tell you, the first time I met Forty Five King, I do believe was in '89, before I even was in BDP. You know, I was around the BDP, of course, because of my brother, but I wasn't in the group. But um, I went up to check out DJ Red Alert. I used to go up there from time to time. I was still in school, went up to see Red Alert. He used to let me come and just chill out up at Kiss FM and just watch him DJ, which was like just me being in hip hop heaven. Um, and different DJs used to be up there. I met um, Mr. Long from Black Sheep up there. This is 89. Black Sheep didn't come out till 91. I remember Mr. Long was like, yo, my name is Mr. Long. I make beats. And he had a Walkman. And he was like, listen to some of my music. And he put the headphones on my ears. And he was playing me beats. I don't even remember if the beats were dope or not. They probably were. But I just remember thinking like, yeah, okay, like, you know, I don't make beats. I wasn't in the game. But, you know, because of KRS-One, once he said my brother's name is Kenny, that's Kenny Parker. Everybody knew who I was, but I wasn't in the game. But Mr. Long was playing me beats at Kiss FM, which I thought was dope. And I met 45 King up there. And um, he used to have all of these promos on Kiss FM that Red Alert used to play, different promos. And he's, I think Latifah's single, Wrath of My Madness, was out. And we were up there, and it was too many people up there. And security came and was like, Y'all got to go. So a lot of y'all got to leave because it's too crowded up here at the radio station. And so people was getting ready to leave. And um, 45 King 
was you know was leaving too. And I was like, no, I, I'll leave. Like you know, I'm out. And Forty Five King was like, nah, you know, you you don't have to leave. Like if anybody's supposed to be up there, BDP supposed to be up here. And I'm like, you're the Forty Five King. You got records playing. Like I'm not in BDP. <laughs> like you're the Forty Five King. I'm related to KRS One, but you're a actual producer. You belong up here more than me. And we started laughing. It was like, you know, both of us trying to say the other one should stay. It was just funny. Um, but he was mad humble, always humble, always soft spoken. Um, rest in peace to the 45 King. Shout out to the Flavor Unit. Latifah's album was dope. And no, a lot of people don't talk about Chill Rob G's album was banging, y'all. CD Max C, Break of Dawn, De La Soul. Dilla did that? If Dilla did that, that would be my number one. Are you sure about that? I thought that was De La and, um, and um, Prince Paul. You sure about that? Um, Rod Justice Hip Hop. I grew up with a member of the Spaniels family who fought for royalties my whole childhood, and they were a 50s group. How is it that in the 1980s, artists were still getting jerked by record labels? Because... You know, I, I, I can do a whole dissertation on that. I'm going to do the short version of it. Um, the information, what's in your contract and the information like publishing and royalties and merchandising and the stuff that artists are supposed to get points on the album that was like top secret knowledge. And, and st when we got in the game, I'm going to say this here, I'm, but I'm, do I'm doing a whole story on this, but I'm going to talk about it right here. I feel like my generation jerked hip hop. And the reason I say this is because of this. The, the 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 record companies had a a string a stranglehold on R and B uh, on all on all um music. It was very hard to get royalties. They had a stranglehold on the game. When the first wave of rappers came in in '79, Flash and all of them, Curtis Blow, all of them, Run DMC, they all got jerked, ridiculously jerked by black people. I've seen my brother speak on this. Many times, black executives who knew the business turned around and jerked the young black kids coming up and took their money and publishing and rights. So after that first wave, after the, I'm not even gonna count flashing them because they they didn't even get like they didn't even they had like single deals. They was just they was they was had the noose around their neck completely. But when when people started getting albums on major labels like say Run DMC, LL, BDP, uh, Salt and Pepper, you know, anybody signed to Def Jam, anybody signed to a major label, that first wave all got jerked too for their money. Now, in my opinion, that was my error. In my opinion, we were supposed to school the next wave coming up. Brand Nubians, naughty leaders, you know, that wave. We were supposed to school them. But instead of us schooling them, we did the same exact thing that the, 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 the people did before us. Keep the information for ourselves. And instead of schooling them and telling them, you have power. You own your publishing. You have to sell it or sell it or sign it away. Somebody can't just take it. You have power. Instead of telling the people the rules, what we did was took production deals and little label deals from the majors. We took the crumbs off the table of the majors and divvied it out to the next generation coming up. We jerked them. 
we took the crumbs off the tables of the majors and broke the crumbs into little pieces and gave it to the next generation coming up. The, you know, the NWAs and, well, NWA is part of our stuff, but not NWAs, like gang stars and, you know, that era. That era was supposed to be so knowledgeable on the game from us, but we didn't do it. Instead, we jerked them. We all, in the 90s, everybody got labels. They was giving out label deals like it was hotcakes. If you had a hit record in like the mid-90s, if you had a hit record or some buzz, they was like, you're dope. We don't know anything about hip-hop, but we know you do because you got a hit. Do you have any friends? We'll give you a label deal. Go sign your friends and bring them here. You were supposed to set your people up so nice with, with points and publishing, but instead you, we jerked them. And I'm going to say we, our generation. We jerked our own cousins coming up. And we knew the game. We knew. Flash and them didn't really know. Sugar Hill was the first company that was jerking, right? In 79, 80. Those dudes, they didn't, they, they didn't know nothing. They, they, they was done. By the time they went to the studio, they was finished. But by the time like the Def Jam people started coming and then Jive and like I said, Warner Brothers started signing groups and then they jerked them. We were supposed to go, look, y'all, Buster, listen. What's your name, Buster? What's your group, Leaders of New School? Listen, this is how it's going down. This is what happened to me. When you go in that meeting, say this. We didn't do that. Instead, we jerked them. And that's, to me, some bullshit. And I'm going to do a whole breakdown on that, but I'm just venting right now. But, you know, to answer your question, why is it that in the 1980s, artists were still getting jerked by labels and into the 90s? We didn't know. Dudes just didn't know. And you would think, you know, maybe the R&B dudes that got jerked in the 60s and 50s would have told the hip hop people what happened. But the hip, the, the R&B guys didn't talk to, to the hip hop kids. They didn't even respect us as musicians. Just, that's not music. So, you know, I'm going to use Marvin Gaye's example. He's huge. Let me not even use Marvin. DeBarge. The bar should have told LL Cool J, yo, this is how it goes. But instead, they didn't say anything. Nobody said anything. Nobody said anything about publishing until like the 2000s, in my opinion. Nobody didn't know nothing. That's just a, 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 a that's my short version of your answer. Sorry to get winded, y'all, but I'm very passionate about that. Um, my generation jerked. My generation knew. I don't know about any other generation, but them dudes that got deals in 88, 89, 90, and, and they saw what it was, they were supposed to school everybody. All right, I'm going to move on. Um, MM Crossfire, that's a good point, Kenny. I would have thought there would have been more information shared between artists. No information, zero. And that's some suckers. But why would you give the information when you can get the money? If I, instead of, if I see a group called Leaders of the New School and they look dope, I have two options. Tell them the truth and maybe they'll get paid or tell them nothing and say, sign to me and let me walk you into the master's table and and I'll and, and then they'll get the money. Some sucker shit, man. It's all sucker shit. It was all sucker shit. Guess who? Guess who? Guess who MFs? Guess who MFs? Def Jam knew. Def Jam knew. And what was they doing? Jerking. I saw an article, and I do believe this is true. That the great public enemy. And I'm putting the word great in front of them. Got 30 cents a record. Keep in mind, y'all, the record company. See, I, I don't want to go too crazy, but I don't know if I'm boring you guys with this, but I'm going to say this real quick and I'm going to get off this subject. 
The record company makes an album, right? And they sell it to the distributor for eight to ten dollars. Let's use ten dollars an even number. They sell it to the distributors for ten dollars. The distributor buys it for ten, and they sell it to the record store for twelve dollars. Right. So now the distributor makes two dollars. The record store now they buy it for twelve, and they sell it to you for fourteen. When was thirteen ninety nine? Whenever it got to that level. The record company tax on another two dollars. So the record company is going to get like two bucks. The distributor is going to get like two bucks. The record company is selling it for ten dollars. A dope record deal in the 80s, in the 90s, in the late 80s, 90s, a dope record deal. An artist would get a dollar. That's a yo, you killed it. Your lord, you hugging your lawyer. Woo, you did your thing. You got me a dollar out of the 10 that the record company is going to sell this album for. And out of your dollar is all the expenses come out of your dollar. So they're lending you the dollar. They're not even giving you the dollar. They're lending you the dollar. With that being said, I heard, saw, I read somewhere and think, but I'm, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say I heard that Public Enemy was getting 30 cents a record on Def Jam. 30 cents. Keep my Def Jam. Okay, let's say in the 80s, they were selling the record for $8, not 10. Say $10 is a 90s price. Say Def Jam was selling to the distributor for $8. They was giving P.E. 30 cents. 10 cents for Chuck, 10 cents for Flavor, and 10 cents for the Bomb Squad. That's criminal, y'all. Black-owned company doing this to Black artists. And that's why, you know, now, you know, we're in America and it's capitalism and it's business. So you're trying to get the best deal possible. So you don't expect a record company to tell an artist. We're about to sell your album to the distributor for eight dollars and we're only giving you a quarter. That's good. That's good American business. If you could get that off and they, they agree to it and you, they sign the contract. That's good business. My argument is with the artist who got the quarter. Once you figure out that you got a quarter and you got to pay that quarter back per album, you're supposed to be screaming at the top of your lungs to the next dudes coming up. Yo, brand Nubians, don't sign for no quarter. Make them give you at least a dollar. I remember when Michael Jackson did Thriller. I'm, this is my last, and I'm getting off this subject, yo. Michael Jackson, I remember when Thriller was out. Y'all can fact check me on this. When Thriller was out, the biggest selling album of all time, Michael Jackson got a renegotiating of his contract. Michael Jackson got like $2 a record. Unheard of. Michael Jackson got $2. Woo! He had to sell 100 million copies of an album to get $2 out of the eight for his next album. I guess that would be bad or whenever he whenever he read up. Maybe it was bad into dangerous. Whenever he read up, he got $2. Why do you think Prince has slave on his face? At least he tried to tell us. Prince tried to tell us. Prince tried to tell us when Prince probably got his Purple Rain check and looked at that shit. I just sold 13 million copies. My shit is diamond certified. And this is my check. Slave. Prince tried to tell us. But he, by the time he found out, he was already in the chokehold. So you don't, by the time you find out, you're already in the chokehold. But the thing was, we were supposed to tell the next generation and we didn't. Instead, we signed them to production deals. So they got a crumb off the crumb. All right, y'all, I'm going to get off this rant. And we had an hour and 14 minutes. I'm going to get off soon. I'm sorry I went too hard with this, y'all, but I'm very passionate about this subject. Triggs, 9802. Bun B, I saw that. 
Bun B from UGK talks about how Karis Hunt tried to stop them from signing the contract with Jai because the contracts were bogus. Chris knew. Chris knew. But Chris learned. Chris learned twice. Criminal minded was absolute. They got no Vaseline for criminal minded. Then they signed to Jive for the dollar, I guess. I don't know what Chris's contract was, but it was at that time probably a state standard contract that they were giving to artists, which probably was somewhere around a dollar, you know, whatever that was. I don't know that for sure, but I'm, you know, something like that. So when Chris learned what it was, he was like, oh, hell no. He was already in the chokehold. Seven album deal, you in. So when he saw UGK, they was like, we about to sign. When he saw UGK in the hallway, he's like, what's your name, UGK? Did you sign already? I saw, and Bun B was like, yeah, we just signed a job. And Chris said, oh, damn. I'm like that. <laughs> Had Bun B said, no, we're about to go in the office and sign right now, Chris would have given them the game. And I saw that interview. Shout out to KRS for trying to teach people the game. Chris taught me the game. Chris told me what happened to him. And I told my people the game, you know, as best you can. But it's terrible, man. It's it's. But I, I, I don't blame the record companies. I don't. They are snakes by nature. This is what they do. They are walking human vultures. That's what they do. But when a vulture swoops down and carry off one of your kids <laughs> in a way, you're supposed to tell everybody in the village, yo, there's vultures flying around snatching kids. Yo, we either got to secure your kids, kill these vultures, do something because there's vultures swooping down. Don't just be like, oh, they got my kids. I'm just not going to say nothing. I'm going to get down with the vulture and help them snatch somebody else. That, that, that's not how you do it. Cut from a different cloth. Those were the standard contracts back then. Everybody got got. Um, yeah, everybody got got. But we could have got got for less. We could have fought for more. If we all got to get, if, if, the, if dudes knew that your publishing is yours, you don't have to give it to anybody. That's yours. Publishing is where all the money is. That's yours. Somebody either has to buy it from you or you sign it away. Just that little information right there would have made millions for the kids coming up. Sugar Daddy won Williams. Ice Cube knew. Ice Cube knew. Ice Cube looked at that NWA contract and was like, nah. And he tried to tell the rest of them and they dissed him. For not signing. But even Ice Cube, he knew because he had, I guess, an innate intuition that something is, is fishy here. Now, he probably didn't know exactly what it was, but he's like, nah, I still live at home with my mother and we just sold platinum and I still live in my mama house. You know, he's like, nah, something ain't right. But I'm taking it a step further. I'm saying the artists that got jerked, they knew. When I tell you they knew, when, when you get 30 cents a record and you find out what you, when you go 30 cents a record and you go platinum and you find out what your check is, when you're TLC and you become the biggest selling female rap group, the biggest selling female group of all time passing the Diana Ross and the Supremes and you're bankrupt. You can't even pay your rent and you're the biggest selling female group of all time. TLC should have been, they tried to speak on it in interviews. They should have been screaming to the top of their lungs to the next people coming down the pike. Yo, nah, man, this ain't it. Um, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna 
relax. I didn't, I didn't want to take this, this, this conversation in that direction, but, um, our justice hip hop, B-Boy records and job. Yeah. Chris got, imagine the amount of money that KRS one has made in the game is enormous and it's peanuts compared to what other people made off of him. Divine existence, word. I was signed to a production deal in 93. Them production deals was bullshit. Or at least, it wasn't bullshit, at least dudes could have gave you something fair. I mean, you gotta understand a production deal is a crumb off a crumb. That's a smaller piece of the crumb. You know who did right? Damn, I'm just, I'm just, I don't know. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna save this for another day. Chef Dad, did you make more than five cents per album for your work with the BDP? Well, it didn't really break down like that because my work with BDP, I was not signed to BDP, first of all. So I didn't get royalties like that. I was not signed to Jai. I was a producer, so I got points and publishing on the songs that I worked on. But even then, I've done stuff, ghost producing, on big songs and got jerked for a lot of money. And I didn't know. I didn't know the game and got jerked by my friends. I'm going to go into that later on. Lawrence Henderson, this is a documentary in the making. Yeah, I was, I want to do a whole thing on it. I mean, I've given away a lot of the premise, but there's more I want to get into. You know, the title is going to be My Generation Jerk, My Generation Jerk Hip Hop. It was us. It was us. It was the artists from 88 to 80, 90. It was artists that got them deals. It was us. It wasn't flashing them. It was us. We, we could have did something. MM Crossfire. I think Q-Tip said it best on the low end theory. Industry rule number 4,080. Red Cone people are shady. That's probably Q-Tip's most quoted line. Let me say this. I'm going to say this and I'm getting off, y'all. This is it. I, 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 I did a lot. Um, I disagree with Q-Tip on that line. I think calling industry people shady is a compliment. Industry shady is like two or three levels up from what they really are. There's industry people right now saying, wow, Q-Tip called us shady. He loves us. Shady? I'll take shady all day. Now, they're way worse than shady. Sh Q-Tip was nice. Record company people are shady. That's that's me saying, hey, what's well, shout out to my homies. Because they Shady is, these people are human sewage. There's people right now that will make money off of you and see you a few years later laying on the sidewalk homeless. They will step over you like they don't even know you and get into the car that they bought with the songs you made and ride off to Long Island somewhere and step over you like they never even seen you in life. These people are the worst of the worst. And it's just about all of them too. All right, y'all, we had an hour and 23. I went, we went, we we just, um, we just went, I mean, I just got caught up. MM Crossfire, when you put it that way, Kenny, yeah, my bad. Um, Criminal Mind, are you talking about Puff now? I'm not going to say any names. I mean, Julie Russo, Tommy Boy. Um, I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna. I'm not gonna call anybody else out. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna say, Markeith Bankroll, Souls of Mischief didn't get jerked. I don't know what their deal is. You got to understand the whole game is a jerk. 
if they're selling the record for eight dollars and you created the record, you did everything. All they did was lend you the money to go into the studio. You got to pay that back. And they sold it for eight dollars. Now, then it became ten in the nineties. They sell a record to the distributor for ten dollars and they give you a dollar. What kind of shit is that, man? What what is that? That's a 90-10 split. And it's not even a split because I got to pay you back. So the social mischief didn't get jerked. What was their deal? Did they get $1.50? They didn't get what Michael Jackson got. Michael Jackson got $2. The king, the king of pop got $2. So I know souls of mischief. And that's a jerk. Michael Jackson. All right, y'all. I'm getting off. I'm 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 trying to look at these last little bit of um these comments. Um, I don't want to diss anybody. Um, I, somebody said, just look at the new tricks. Just look at the new edition story. It's every story. Tone two ten. Kenny is being an independent artist the way to go. Yeah, but then you can't get the promotion you need because the machine has radio, had radio and everything on lockdown. So it was very difficult. Um, Pat did Pat did that 32. All I know is I'm officially down with BDP. KP, dope, dope, dope. Thank you. Um, this is just my rant, y'all. Um, it's it gets deeper than that. But um this is just my rant. Um, everybody got jerked. Everybody signed to a record label got jerked. All right, I'm going to get out of here, y'all. Thank you so much to everybody who checked out this live. It may cause some controversy. Don't tell anybody the title of my, my of my, um, of my, um, lot of my, of my, of my concept yet until I put it out. So we're gonna keep this amongst us in, in the little in, in this little arena here. Um thank you. We do this every Tuesday, every Tuesday, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. God willing, I will be back next week. MM Crossfire Peace, Muck Muck Peace, Green Lion Peace, um, Tone 210, thank you, peace. All right, y'all, I'm clicking off e-money, BDP for life. All right, I'm out, y'all. Peace, peace.